Hello, this is Greg Allison from Galactic Gregs. Coming to you from the Missile 2 Space Launch 2 rocket of the Altitude Liftoff Program, or the Payload Program, hanging from the cylinders straight to Ale Brewery in Huntsville, Alabama. 21 years, one month, and three days ago, I was running for my life from this rocket. And today it hangs here. But we were taking our stop, our step in space, and you can too. And I'm going to talk a lot more about this and other similar topics on this channel. If you're not already subscribed to my channel, please uh, click subscribe and click the update notification bell. Many more great videos to come. Tonight I'm bringing you a panel discussion on space, about the past, or the future. How do we get back to the moon? I hope you enjoy. Hello, I'm Greg Allison. I'm president of the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society. We are the local chapter of the National Space Society. And uh, we're bringing you a panel tonight on uh, winter exploration. The past informs the future. Uh, HAL 5 has a long history here in Huntsville, Alabama, starting in uh, 1983. I was the founding president. Uh, and we had, uh, back then, a lot of the uh, German old timers, actually, Conrad Dannenberg called our first meet together. So uh, we have Heidi, who's a descendant of, of, of the, the, the Germans here, is one of them. And we, we used to meet with the German Culture Club and uh, the World Future Society and things like that. But here in Huntsville, we, we've done a lot of things in HAL 5. We ran two uh, International Space Development Conferences. We started a program developing hybrid rockets to launch from altitude balloons. And one of those rockets is hanging downstairs in the cafeteria, and that's our Space Launch 2 rocket. The SO-1, Space Launch 1 rocket, made the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the highest flight of an amateur rocket. I think that's the year wrong. The year was actually the year we were trying to shoot that one up, but I actually, some of us were running from that one for our lives on the deck of the NASA Pearl River March. <laughs> and a, a few of the, the uh, Halo crew members are with us, like Ron Krill's in the table, David Hewitt's all I'll go in that in a minute. So we've had a lot of adventures in HAL 5. Uh, we've run two power grid defense conferences, some regional conferences, and we do public programs. We try to do something every month. Occasionally there's an exception. Typically we pick the thurs first Thursday at the library. Uh, this month, uh, <coughs> excuse next month in August, on the 8th, we have a program on nuclear propulsion by uh, nuclear thermal propulsion. And the speaker will be Dr. Uh, Jonathan Witter. So uh, that will start at 7 p.m. at the Public Library downtown for a book by the First Baptist Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, if you know what I mean. So we like to have a little fun here in Cal 5. So uh, I'm going to do a little brief bio introduction of each speaker. Oh, by the way, 40 years and a few days ago, I was at the Von Braun uh, uh, Astronomical Society. That's where I met Mark Stuhlinger. And uh, that we were at the 10th anniversary of going to the moon. <laughs> and uh, that's where I celebrated that. And Ernst Sillinger, I was just a kid, 19 year old, he spent a lot of time explaining to me how they lofted the dome there, all the dome and that uh, planetarium, all the things they've done. And I was really impressed by how much time that those guys would spend trying to encourage young people. So I always, uh, well, let's learn from these guys is always try to help the young people and pass the baton. And that's something that we, we, we stress here. And that's kind of what this panel is about. It's the past and form and the future. So we're sticking with that theme here. And, uh, uh, and a lot of people that work for the Germans also emulated that. Like my mentor when I was at NASA, that's where he got his from. Uh, example, that was from Conrad Denver, who also knew. His name was George McKay. And uh, th those gentlemen taught that. And they lived it to, to, to teach the young people and pass the baton. And uh, so I just want to emphasize that. And oh, by the way, 40 years ago, a few days after I met Ernst Sillinger, 40 years ago today, I joined the Army. <laughs> so when I was at Fort uh, Jackson, looking up at the full moon and basic training, I vowed I would go there. So I'm going to leave these two young gentlemen up here to tell me how they're going to get me there, because I still want to go and make that vow again. <laughs> so, all right, so we'll get with it here. Uh, at the end of the table is Ron Creel. Ron. It's worked with us in HAL 5 for some time. He was a big part of our Halo Altitude liftoff program developing those hybrid rockets. But prior to that, right out of college, 50 years ago, he got assigned to work on uh, uh, the thermal test and verifications and mission support for, for the thermal control systems on the lunar rover vehicle. And so he just went straight out of college, right into the Apollo program, working on the rover. 
and he's not stopped since. He's a non-stop guy, and he's working today with the students that do the moon buggy uh, challenges at the Space and Rocket Center. So uh, uh, that, that's quite an accomplishment there. And uh, next to, to, to him is uh, Skeet Vaughn, Otha Vaughn, we all call him Skeet. And I first knew him as Dr. Lightning, that's how George McKay introduced uh, 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 Skeet Vaughn to me as Dr. Lightning, because he had lightning experiment, experiments on uh, some of the first shuttle flights. But prior to that, he joined the Army Ballistic Missile Agency back in 1956. And I, that was before I even existed. So uh, he's been involved for quite a while. He was in, he was a first lieutenant in the uh, Air Force. Uh, he was a pilot uh, at one point, and uh, he's also worked. Uh, uh, as a, so he went and got his me a mechanical engineering degree from Clemson a and &M. He's worked for Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. But he was involved in the cooling system design for the Redstone, Jupiter C, and Juno missiles, which also a lot of that became the first stage of the Saturn I. And uh, and so he he says that he was quite excited. These memorable events were like Explorer One launch and things like that. So uh, he he's, he was involved before the Apollo program and our very foundational rockets and, and, and the things that got us started. So I'm sure uh, he could talk all night. And, probably for months on end, and we, we, we never could cease to learn from a guy like him. Uh, so I'm very happy he's here tonight. Uh, Luke Talley, just to the left of, of Skeet Vaughn, uh, got out of college and started working uh, with the Federal Electric Corporation. He worked from there from 1965 to 67. And by the way, he uh, uh, He's had uh, degrees from, uh, his electrical engineering came from the uh, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. But he's also attended uh, uh, University of North Carolina in Charlotte, some other places. He's worked radar systems and many things along his career. But he started out working ground support and, and quality assurance layout on, on the uh, Apollo. And, uh, and he went on to work the instrument ring. And he did all this for IBM Corporation. He was working the instrument ring from 67 to 71 for, for the Saturn. Uh, vehicle. So he was involved in the early design of the digital computer system and in part of that revolution that led us to, to a whole uh, change the world today. The digital computers are just running everything today. So uh, he worked Skylab and then he went on to work uh, Patriot Missile Systems and he came back to Huntsville and worked uh, retired working from uh, Wiley Labs. And uh, I shuffle back to my paper here. Logan Kennedy now he's one of the young guys I'm counting on to get me back to the moon here because he's actually uh, started at NASA in two, uh, two, uh, 2006 as a co-op. He's from NC State, and I went to, to, to North Carolina, I went to, to South Carolina. Oh, not NC State? I thought you were saying North Carolina. I was going to say you're our rival. With me. Oh. <laughs> I spent some time at Fort Bragg, and I used to go up to, to visit some friends in NC State because they had an aerospace engineering program up there. My first... My first chapter of the L5 Society was in North Carolina, uh, so uh, we had quite a group up there. Anyway, and then I went to Alaska, so that's another story. Where I met Ed Geiger, we started the North Star L5 Society, by the way. So um, he, he started out as a GNC engineer, and then he got to work, uh, uh, he did that for SLS, and then he got to work this mighty Eagle Lander test bed. And that was a program manager and systems engineer. <laughs> focused on uh, lunar landers uh, and as this uh, resource prospector for the 2004 lunar mission. And uh, Dave Hewitt here is a, a, a young gentleman who started out with us and I took him out to the ocean with, with balloon launch rocket project when he was still like a freshman in college. And so now here he is, you know, uh, you know a well-developed engineer working at Dianetics, but you know, we, we spun off some things from our Halo program. Uh, you know, we spun off a little company called Hart, and then uh, Tim Pickens spun off a Ryan Propulsion, and David worked for, for Ryan Propulsion, and Ryan Propulsion got bought up by Dianetics. And so Dave's still doing that. He's still just doing the follow-ons while we're doing. He's actually working on the Lunar Lander project now. David, you want to say a word about it? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, transitioning into working full-time finally on this, but uh, I've been, this has been in the wings for three years, but uh, I'm, we're going to be integrating the propulsion system for a robotic lander that's going to be landing in the, the uh, Lacus Mortis on the moon in 2021 with our customer. Yeah. Now you see, 
Why I said I, I, I uh, camped on these young guys here to get me to the moon and to fulfill my vow I made back when I was in the Army 40 years ago. So, that said, we're going to take this panel through from the past to focus how the lessons learned from that can get us to the future. And with that in mind, though, I want each of the panelists to, to, to kind of explain themselves, but, I, but in a definitive way. So I'm going to ask each one to spend about three minutes and explain their defining experience in lunar exploration, starting with Ron Krill. Ron? Thank, thank you. It's great to see quite an audience here tonight. Uh, as uh, Greg said, I worked uh, thermal control, and uh, I tell the story that uh, they uh, out there testing, uh, testing is very important. They're testing, test, test, test. In fact, I'm hoping they can do more testing of what I'm hearing for this lunar lander that's going to go back up there. But uh, uh, talking about the testing, uh, I was getting ready to take the wheel from the rover on a treadmill back up into the vacuum chamber. We tested it in a vacuum chamber. And uh, uh, the night came when we were going to go the longest time of exposure, a driving period while the wheels were blown. And uh, these uh, technicians, I was only 24 years old, and the technicians, they kind of looked at me kind of like, who's this kid from NASA, you know, what does he know about these things? And so uh, I, and they said, what do you think the maximum temperature is going to be? It's going to be the hottest temperature. So I said, 254 degrees. So I went out to dinner, came back, and uh, uh, I, they, they were very mum. I said, well, what did what, you get? What was the temperature? They were very mum about it. So I went over to the strip charts and looked at that. Looks like 253 degrees. Uh, I was not, I was off a little bit. So uh, that, uh, but basically, what I what I tell people here uh, when I when I lecture, there's two challenges. First one I'm going to talk about is dust. Dust was very prevalent on the moon, and it really affected our radiators. The problem we had was we talked about testing before. We tested even using Apollo 12 dust to, to put on radiators and clean it off with a dust brush here on Earth. Get up on the moon, it's a whole different story up there. And that's why I see a lot of people writing papers about electrostatic wands and things they're gonna use on. I say, wait a minute. <laughs> you can't show me that that's really gonna work on the moon. You better do everything you can to avoid dust ever getting into your lungs or getting onto surfaces that you need to get heat out of because it's, it's not gonna work. All right, very good. Now you got to test the, the, the Apollo 12 dust Well, one of the guys who actually did, designed part of the Apollo 12 mission and uh, it, it said that we should go to the lunar surveyor site was Keith Vaughn and that was what was done, right? Uh, well, basically what I did in the rover program was to come up with a criteria document so they could actually build a rover. In other words, I had to tell them how many craters were in the landing area, how deep the craters were, how big the craters were, what kind of soil materials were there. Without the surveyor program and the orbiter program, we would never land on the moon because those two programs are most important in the whole thing because they gave us one meter resolution photography of the landing sites. So we could actually see the crater down to one meter in diameter. We could all see big boulders at a boulder down the hillside. To develop the criteria documents, we had to come up with some kind of soil mechanics materials. So when they first had the surveyors, the second surveyor landed on the moon, he had a scoop. We could scoop through the soil. When we scooped through the soil, we found out it stand vertical. It didn't fall over like a dust material. So now we're trying to figure out what's called this cohesion in the soil. And if you think about it, it's the vacuum of the space because now in the vacuum of space, everything comes together real good. So that's one thing. So it looked like about the angle of friction or the angle of coefficient of friction for any kind of vehicle would be about 37 degrees on the moon. However, later on when we started developing the actual soil materials which we put the we, we rover wheels running through to determine the power required for the motors on the rovers the wheels we came up with a soil material like this material right here this is a sample of our lunar soil material looks very much like a talcum powder it's very much like a talcum powder but it has a lot of strength i'll show you if you take it like this and tap it like that right there the angle of sand has a angle of friction of about 27 degrees this stuff has an angle of friction of almost 85 degrees. Watch this when I tilt it. That's 45, 55. I'm taking it slow and easy. Now I'll get up to about, there it is, on the crack. So it has an angle of repose of almost 85 degrees, which means that on the moon with a vacuum, and this has air in here too, 
So that means that air, the particles are lubricated by the air, which means it would not stay together as good as on the moon. So therefore, we knew that we had a good design for a rover when we came up. We also designed a rover to have one pound per square inch bearing pressure, footprint pressure on the lunar, mo the lunar module. So we had one pound per square inch bearing pressure on a rover because we figured if we could land on the moon successfully and we didn't sink up in the soil too much, and with a light system of footprint pressure we had a rover, we should have no problem with no mobility on the moon. Would you like to add anything as a defining experience? Steve, would you like to add anything as your defining experience for the lunar exploration? Yeah, I think you ought to go back to the same thing. Talk in the microphone. Okay. Talk in the microphone. I think we can hear you. I don't know. Oh, okay, okay. Very good. Very good. So I like what you're saying. You think we should go back just like we went? <laughs> All right, so same, same question with Luke Halley. What is your defining experience? Here we go. <laughs> My turn. Well, I worked for IBM for 31 years and started out, I didn't know a one from a zero, so I had a little bit of digital learning to go through and started out in the IU hardware, primarily some software uh, involved because it gets involved in everything now. But I think the biggest experience I got out of doing on the, working on the space program, the Patriot Missile Program, and the uh, commercial world of IBM is that things that uh, I see happening, I think the young people today need to go back and keep in mind the best thing you can do is keep it simple. Everybody is trying to over complex everything that they do. You know, I've got oh, I've got this processor now, I can execute so much stuff, therefore, I can add all this stuff. Well, I add all that stuff, and if that processor conks out, I just lost an awful lot of my mission. And those that's very important. And I think the second most important thing I learned is just what uh, Ron, <laughs> Ron said, no, that's <laughs> Ron says it's test, test, test. That is so important. And when we were in IBM, we had all kind of classes we would go to. We, we were required to have 40 hours of uh, technical uh, classes every year. And so one of the things that was drilled into our head is how do you know when the last bug is out of the program? And that is a tough, tough question. And the only way you can answer it is just test that stuff to death. I'll give you one example. Remember Y2K? There it is. Well, in 97, we started looking at our software and trying to do just that. What, what is in there that can bite us and really create havoc? We produced a machine that was used in just about, I would say, 75% of the branch banks, possibly in the United States, Europe, part of Asia, and part of South America. And turns out there was a piece of code in there that says that the year code equals zero, zero, reformat the hard drive. <laughs> Whoa. If we had not caught that, the banking system of the world would probably stop on the first day of year 2000. So you just cannot underestimate the amount of amount of havoc you can create with a piece of software if you don't really test that stuff to the nth degree. And I think a lot of what's happening today is... Look, let, 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 let me ask you a question. I've, I've had people tell me that we don't need to test every executable branch in our flight software. And they told me it was impossible because we had 100,000 lines of code. This is something I heard a couple of years ago. <laughs> I don't know, it's a Greenhorn TPS engineer. I developed 10,000 codes and tested every executable branch by myself 20 years ago. When I, we didn't have all the automation tools available, that's, I, that's hard for me to fathom that an army of people with years can't do that. Did you check that Y2K number and make sure that you know what you're I see you're not in favor of that approach. Uh, no, no. The, the difficulty you have is we, we have people in Space and Rocket Center. I'm running over here. Yeah, yeah. We have people in Space and Rocket Center all the time talking about, oh, my cell phone can do more, blah, blah, blah. Well, 
That's not true. The computer that we had on Skylab was, I mean on uh, Saturn, was pretty limited as far as people think today. There was 16,000 words of memory, which is about 50,000 bytes. The thing would execute 8,700 calculations a second. And by today's standards, your phone probably does two million or two and a half or whatever. We had about 30 or 40 people probably writing the code for that thing. We had literally hundreds and hundreds of people verifying that that was correct. We had a facility here at IBM that we did it. The uh, breadboard out at uh, Qualab did it. Boeing, being the system integrator, did it. Uh, we checked and checked and double checked and triple checked every bit of that code. I remember those guys going to meetings and they'd spend two weeks deciding what to do with eight bytes of data. That's If you're going to go to Mars or the moon, that's what you're going to have to do. You have to get back in that mode and not in this mode of uh, just take it. Hey, this instruction does this. Does it really? What else does it do? We would not use anything except C in our banking system because C plus and C plus plus were not not specified as such. And they have library functions. This library function does this. What else does it do? We would take those functions and take them apart. And finally we said, no, we're staying with C. We're not going with C plus plus and C plus because these library functions do so many things that you don't want to have. Those yeah, there's, there's a lot of things in the code that can bite you. That's right. I had to test. I was doing test program set code. I mean, it was an unmanned system. I had to test it, ring it out totally. Yep. So the, the, we would not do it on the rocket flight code is frightening to me. So I hope that they're beyond that at this point. Anyway, so, so Logan, uh, you, you're a young engineer here, but you're already a program manager. So uh, tell me what you're defining experience. You're coming up fast. Acting project manager. Let me downplay a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, hard act to follow right in the first young guy. Um, but I already see some commonality with, with what you guys have said before. So my, my defining experience was on the Mighty Eagle, which was a, a lunar lander test bed that flew from 2011 to 2013. Um, and we were part of a risk reduction effort to go back to the moon. Because NASA's always going back to the moon in some phase. Uh, but I, I like to say that on Mars, you can cheat and use parachutes and aerobraking breaking to slow yourself down, but on the moon you don't get that luxury, so you gotta do it all propulsively. So we flew this test bed around here, and uh, and, and we built, uh, built we, we, we made a lunar terrain field here. We shipped 225 tons of this volcanic ash from a crater in Arizona to simulate the lunar surface. Um, Merriam Crater, I believe it was. And uh, the, the story I like to tell is that the first time we flew over it, we were doing hazard avoidance, right? So. Think about Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong saw the boulders in the crater, they can avoid that. Well, if you're a small robotic mission, which is about the size of a pool table or so, so the, the size they were looking at at the time, you, how, do you, how do you sense those hazards? We were doing it with a, a stereo camera. So you can, you know, with your two eyes, you can see three dimensions, same thing with two cameras. Um, so we we're gonna fly over that field and, and find the boulders and craters and find a safe place to land. Well, the moon is one sixth our gravity, so we had to simulate the moon by having this Earth gravity canceling thruster in the middle. So it had a lot of thrust coming out the middle just so that the rest of the vehicle thought it was on the moon. The first time we flew over the moon, we kicked up a whole bunch of dust because there was a lot more thrust than you would see on the moon. And so before every flight, we had to literally water the moon. <laughs> we would get the sprinklers out there to water the moon to make sure we didn't have dust because that was all optically based. If you have dust, optics don't work. So um, that's. That, that, that experience working on my Eagle was, um, I don't know how we're going to water the moon this time, but we, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a driving experience. I, I worked on it from cradle to grade, about six months out of school. Kind of a systems engineer, also a GNC engineer, designed the flight plans, um, but I worked on that for, for four years. And, uh, and then now working on the new 2024, I guess it's called Artemis Now, uh, human mission. Awesome. That's great. So, so David, I imagine uh, one of your defining experiences is probably when you and I were running for our lives from that SL3 rocket downstairs, but I imagine you could add to it something more uh, relevant to our topic than that. Yeah, more relevant to the old joke about you've never been a true rocket guy until you've run from your own creation. <laughs> <laughs> and on the software testing thing, um, there used to be a, a flyer that was up around NASA. Uh, there was a picture of a Cylon from Battlestar Galactica. 
you know what those are. They're the evil robots that rose up and tried to take over. And the pictures underneath it says the caption says, uh, "Why software testing matters." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who printed those, but they've been like all over NASA. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I guess my defining experience for lunar exploration, because my career has bounced all over the place in different programs and different things, but uh, one thing that I've noticed is that uh, when you get good at something in your career, no matter what you drift off to, it pulls you back in. It's kind of like the mob, you know. You, once you get in, you just can't get out. Once, you, once people know you're good at something, then you keep getting sucked in no matter where you're working. And, and uh, that's what seems to have been following my career, but I've had multiple flirtations with landing on the moon over the last 12 years. And I, and I think Logan can attest to this as well. We've been part of multiple programs. There was an international lunar network, and there was like those lunar. Oh, there are always these, these precursor lander missions. Um, when I was with Orion Propulsion, we built a uh, cold gas propulsion system for the first lunar lander test bed, which could hover for like eight seconds or ten seconds or something. And and uh, you know, I, I I worked a lot of the early requirements for that and did the proposal for that, but. Uh, they had to clone me at that work in order to get that work done, so I ended up working something else and we hired a guy uh, who, who put that thing to the finish line. And uh, um, at the same time, uh, I was involved with Lunar X Prize. So, you know, Greg and I and some other people in the room with the Hark team, we were briefly part of a, one of the Google Lunar X Prize teams. And uh, later on, I was part of another one that was started by Dynetics. And, 2010 called the Rocket City Space Pioneers. We did X Prize also prior to that. That's right. We were also part of this club was also involved with the Ansari X Prize, which you know kind of kicked off the current commercial space boom that we're in. Um, so as far as the lunar thing, you know, okay, that that program ended, and I went and did other things, and then the NASA Mighty Eagle program came along because we Dynetics by the time by that time the right propulsion had been bought by Dynetics, but we were working on a warm gas propulsion system. That ended up being the propulsion system for the Mighty Eagle with the Earth G canceling thruster and every, every all the other uh, things that go with that. And we picked hydrogen peroxide as the propellant for that. We, how many test flights? What, 30? 45. 45? Depends on what you call a successful flight. Right, right. The very first one it had a little tether on it and, and it kind of bounced around on its tether. It correctly crashed it. Yeah. You can say that. They sent it back to us for warranty repairs. It was all right. But, uh, but it was like NASA broke the lander. That's okay. We'll fix it. Um, but, but all throughout this, I had all these different these different things that were going on where I would go design a propulsion system for a lander, and then the money would dry up for that, and nothing would come of that. Or the business model would dry up, which happened to our, our the Dynetics Google Enterprise team. And we ended up selling that team to somebody else, and you know, one of the people who were, were, were a competitor in that Enterprise team uh, was this astrobotic team out of Pittsburgh, and I always viewed them as highly credible back then, back 10 years ago, I view it was highly credible because they had robotics expertise. Um, I always felt like they didn't have, back then, that they didn't have propulsion expertise. Well, lo and behold, now, um, after years of nurturing, helping nurture the relationship with Astrobotic, uh, uh, we're finally going to uh, be making an attempt with the mission that they originally started designing for their Google X Prize. So, all I'm saying is, it's like, Never turn your back on anything in your career in terms of a skill set that you've built because it's just going to keep coming back to you because uh, once you're an expert at something, they're going to know it. Is that how I got drafted back into being president of Hell of I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to go into another round of questions here. And I'm going to differentiate what I asked the Apollo guys versus the younger guys here because this is going to be more the past to the future focus. So for, for the Apollo guys, the question is as follows. So remember this, because I'm just going to call your names out. What is the most valued lesson learned in your career that you think the next generation needs to learn? Ron, we'll start with you. Well, I think I thought I already answered it, that you got to test, test, test. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, you can add to it now. You've got to buy it. Well, uh, I uh, and I agree with that. Uh, I was going to move on to the next part here and talk about uh, the temperatures on the moon. But uh, well, go ahead. You got three. Well, well, I was going to show you all a plot over here. Uh, what I would like to tell the next generation, I, I, I got, I've been talking this and showing posters and talking about it for several years. If 
finally, they, you know, I said, they asked me to come up with a big meeting last November and talk about uh, how do you survive on the moon? How do you survive the lunar night? See, the way that works with the moon and the sun, you have about almost 15 days of sunlight, and you've got almost 15 days of no sun. And man, when you've got no sun, the temperature plummets down to about minus 280, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and stays there. You can see from this plot over here. The simulation we did. By the way, the simulation we did. The first time, first time I took the mission support simulation. Microphone, please. Microphone, there. Okay. <laughs> 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 then it'll be Vanna White. Okay. Okay. What I was going to say was, first time I took that simulation software, and uh, uh, for the uh, total 181 node uh, thermal model of the rover with all those components on it, and I ran it. I hit the enter key and the results were back immediately. I couldn't believe it. I said, this thing, I know thousands of conductors in here. The, the simulation is very large. What's going on? So, so I cleared out the data, data, punched the enter key again. Again, the results were back instantaneously. So computers nowadays, and that was about three years ago, computers nowadays are just unbelievable. But what you'll see here on this temperature plot, uh, they've got to go through temperatures approaching 260, 280 degrees Fahrenheit when, the, when you have lunar noon down. And here's the plummet down when the, when the, uh, when the, sun, stops, when the sun stops shining. And uh, what you see, this is an insulated system, 15 layers of MLI, and special conduction reduction for the components with, with respect to the chassis. And you can see there's a lag here, but still you get down here for several days at minus 280, minus, three, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what they've got to live to work with, with the guys up here. And that's what I keep telling people. The way we survived before was we used nuclear power. And that, by the way, all the probes that are going out toward the distant universes, they have nuclear power systems on board for power as well as thermal control. And uh, so uh, that's my lesson, that's my lesson uh, from for the, for the new guys. And a uh, few people are listening to me, maybe. Uh, uh, they, uh, they resist, but... Uh, uh, the, other, the other secret, uh, excuse me, I don't agree with this, but the, the gateway, the lunar orbiting gateway, that's vital because the early missions are going to have to go up to the moon, they're going to have to stay there for a few days and leave, go back up into orbit and do whatever they're going to do, maybe go back down, but at least cannot survive on the moon presently with the systems we've got. They are working on new systems at the uh, Glenn Research Center and other places, but their technology readiness level is only at the five or sixth level. You've got to be up in the nine or ten before you're ready to go. Question. Uh, the uh, what about at the? Floor? We're going to do Q and A after we go through this round of questions. We'll have a, a, a open session for uh, first for the, the panelists to ask each other, and then we'll do the audience to 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 the panelists if that's okay with that. way we can kind of get through this stuff. We got a five-person panel, so we do need to kind of keep it moving. Sorry about that. Uh, and our next, and, and, and so ski. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm like, come on, in one sense of word. You know, the Apollo program landed on the moon, and the fact the engine turned off, and they're sitting there for a few minutes, and the flight, the flight controllers noticed that pressure was rising inside the fuel system. And the problem was, if the fuel was rising in the system, it could rupture the system. But luckily, even though it was so cold outside, that's why what happened was that the ice actually they had the fuel actually froze in the line and then over a period of a few minutes there it found the heat from the exhaust and heat from the, the, the nozzle that was still hot that heat actually caused the fuel to start falling again the pressure began to drop and everything all right so like Ron says if you if you go to the moon you got to worry about the cold and with the lunar rover we didn't have to worry about the cold we wouldn't worry about the heat <laughs> that was our problem and we were driving in the daytime too so we didn't have to have things like so I think you'll have to have some kind of nuclear propulsion, a nuclear system to keep everything warm inside the vehicle. I still think you can build a lunar module like we built in Apollo, just make an improved module and go back to the moon without doing a whole new complete redesign system. That module worked beautiful. It was just fantastic the way it worked. And to me, I think we ought to do that. I don't think we should build a gate while I keep talking about it. I think we should build a gateway in Earth orbit like Juan Ram proposed many years ago. And that, therefore, you go from you go from the Earth orbit to the Moon direct. If you try to build the if you try to build the gateway, 
you're going to be five or six years behind on one curve, development curve, to start even to go to the money. So we got to get the first vehicle, SLS, flying first. We've got to be build more than one or two vehicles. We've got to do that. And that's my problem with the LSS is we don't have, we're not doing enough testing. I don't care what anybody says. You can do everything you want on a computer, but garbage in is garbage out sometimes. And so, Amen. I think we need to do a lot more testing, particularly dynamic testing of the vehicle. We haven't done that. And we need a green firing more we require all yeah, We'll talk to the mic. Let's get it. Yeah, we need that also. But, you know, say it green. again. Say that again, please. So I'll, I'll quit. He, he had to ask you to say it again because you weren't talking to the mic. He was talking to me. Say it again about the green firing. Well, the, the green firing is, um, the green firing is, green we'll have all the engine firing on the pad. And I don't think they want to do that right now. They want to just start the first flight with all engines firing. I don't think they want to do that. <laughs> yeah, there's some scheduled pressure to, to, to skip the green run test, perhaps. But I'm, I'm, I'm uh, of the opinion that that, needs, that test needs to happen. As I was telling David, I was surprised to see they're not going to test this attitude control of this lander in Earth orbit either. They're going to go all the way up, get off there, and going to find out what's going to happen once you get there. All right, Lee, what, what do you think about this? It's your chance to hey, you're, you're back to tell us what we need to know. Back to the one zero guy again. <laughs> and the one, without the ones and zeros, we're not going to get there. Test, test, test. Right. <laughs> That's right. Common thread here. That's yes. Well, we all do. Well, if you, we're looking forward, and probably in the next couple of years, we're going to see the beginnings of what's the true supercomputers they're trying to get to 10 to the 18 floating point calculations a second out of these machines. Now these are not something you're going to put in your pocket. These things take up you know, 3,000 square feet, suck up megawatts of power and uh, various things like that. But for the young people coming in today, we used to would take, we would get data back, telemeter data in a printout form. We'd sit there and we'd take every point and calculate okay, the number is a, an octal number, convert that to a decimal number, look at a calibration curve and write down, okay, at this time it was this many degrees. Go back, do it again, do it again. And we sit there and we make this plot. And we go along and we say, boy, there's an odd little wiggle there. I wonder what that is. And we would go back and analyze and try to figure out, well, God, you know, that, that, that indicates this component is about to conk out and you could lose a mission if you lose this component. Today, load it into Excel, plot it out, it's between those limits, good shot, go. And that's where I think we're, we're missing in a lot, of, a lot of areas. The other thing is, as we get to the supercomputers, the young people that are, we got some young people here, in their careers, they're gonna be using supercomputers or whatever. Let me tell you a quick story about supercomputers. 2003, Virginia Tech uh, tried to build a supercomputer. They went out and bought a thousand, uh, I think they were uh, Apple processors. Put this thing together, didn't put any uh, error correction or anything in their machine. It would never boot up. So they sold all the processors from them. We don't know why that happened. Well, 2009, Cray had a supercomputer with, uh, out at Oak Ridge. And there was a discussion about, uh, I've now got this machine and I'm, I'm operating with 500,000, close to a million processors. All these processors have memory. Memory turns out to be a chunk of current day memory makes a very good cosmic ray detector. So they had assumed that they might get a hundred errors a day from the cosmic rays. So they decided to instrument this thing and see. It turned out to getting 354 a minute. So as you go forward, uh, you're going to have to think a lot more level than we did when we were building the Saturn computer and Apollo and the things we're talking about here. Now, the real killer is this one. IBM has what's called a Blue Gene, G-E-N-E Gene, Blue Gene L machine at Lawrence Livermore. And they began to experience frequent errors and crashing with their cache memory, which is very high speed memory in this thing. 
So what in the world is going on with this thing? You know, well, it might be cosmic particles. No, no, that's not it. Fiddle, fiddle, fiddle around, and lo and behold, the solder that was used to put this chip on the board. Okay, solder has lead. Lead is the last decay product of uranium. Occasionally, it would emit an alpha particle and clobber the memory. <laughs> so. If you're going forward and you think about putting all this, these new devices that are very, very capable, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We're down and down to where we're, memory, we're storing, uh, you know, just a charge of a few electrons. It don't take much cosmic particle to clobber that. And you're going to the moon, you know, that's the cosmic particles out there. You're going to Mars, man, that's just incredible. So. Test, test, test. Well, even for the small hybrid rocket programs that we did with HAL 5, the HALO program, HAL 2 liftoff, we believe even then, 20 years ago, it test, test, test. We did 300 motor firings, static motor firings on test stands. We did over a dozen balloon flights before we ever tried to do our first rocket mission. We also did a ground launch uh, uh, of a rocket coming out of our Blue launch launcher, which is much oversized for launching on the ground, and kind of had us kind of thinking that rocket might be coming after us too. Then, so uh, Dave and uh, Bill Brown, a few others, Ryan Creel, a few others here amongst us have had experiences uh, being downrange from rockets on more than one occasion. <laughs> but we didn't believe in this test philosophy, and I'm, I'm not seeing that a lot today. And that, so that concerns me uh, greatly. And uh, a lot of people think that the computers have all the answers and their software and their models and what they got in their textbooks. And when I hear that, my eyes glaze over and I think run for the hills. Yeah, it's not going on. That's why Microsoft sends you an update every Tuesday. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little hard to deal with when you're on your way to Mars and the communication lags an hour out, right? So. <laughs> So, uh, here's what I want to do now. I'm gonna, we're going to change the question for the next generation, uh, next generation, for the younger guys here. And so, so the next question is, is going to be, what would you most like to know from those who first developed lunar exploration? And to the guys who are developing lunar exploration today, Logan, we'll start with you. All right, so first, to uh, address some concerns, we definitely are thinking about the thermal concerns, Ron, just to ease your mind a little bit, the, the whole survive the night issue and how cold it is for how long it is, that's definitely being thought of. I, I hear about it all the time. Um, it is on people's radar, I make you feel better about it. Um, the first few missions um, and, and several missions I've worked on are planning on getting everything done during the day, the first day. Um, so you don't just survive the night if you don't aren't, aren't there for the night. So that, that's one way to handle it. Um, but then after that, you know, these you know, Artemis is meant to be a sustainable mission. It's not, you know, the, the tight line is, we're not just doing flags and footprints this time. We're supposed to be sustainable. And so surviving the night um, is built into this eventual program. So it's, it's, it is a big deal and we are thinking about it. And it is hard. Um, so that's- If you got like a question for them, Kat, yeah, this is a good time to ask it because they're getting another round and y'all can do some good. So, so my, yeah, my question was more of a bigger picture since, since, I, since I have, gotten into the programmatics recently, um, I, I have two big worries, I guess. One is that it doesn't happen in the first place. Um, you know, being an NASA, you know, not a ton of time, but seeing so many dips and, and cancellations, um, a lot of it's programmatics and budgets and everything, but on the technical side, I'm worried about an Apollo 1, a Challenger, or a Columbia. What are some technical worries that, that we, we should be looking out for um, that would make it not happen in the first place. Um, and then the other thing I'm worried about is, uh, you know, being a big Apollo buff myself, I see that the public disinterest after Apollo 11 and the subsequent reduction in funding and everything being sad and being where NASA's been since the 70s is not where we were in the 60s. And, and what can we do to, to keep the interest up in the, in the context of social media and all the crazy things these kids are doing these days. How can we, how can we prevent that from happening? So big, big picture, uh, make it happen in the first place and, and keep it going for a long time in, in our political climate that we're in. 
Those are, those are tough questions. I, I always tell people here that uh, the night of Apollo 13, I thought it was all over. Because uh, that was major. Uh, the guys were really in danger of dying. And they got them back, and we still weren't out of the woodwork. President Nixon tried to kill it at that point. He didn't want to blame on him that somebody died on, on, his, on his watch. And uh, somehow we figured out and kept going. And uh, then, uh, uh, but uh, I, I just don't, you've always got the unknown unknowns. And it is awfully tough out there in space. And they're very brave guys to go up, get on those rockets. I, I, somebody asked me yesterday, they said, uh, would, you, would you go to space? I said, no, I'm here, I'm anchored here on Earth. And, and uh, doing my best I can here. But uh, uh, I don't know the answer to some of these things, unknown unknowns. I do know it will be a little bit embarrassing for some of these people that are going up there and they're saying they're only going to be there for a few days. Uh, people, people that write the checks, people that write the checks are going to say, what? what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said you were going to go up there and stay. I don't know how you do that here in the near term. I really don't with the, with the cold temperature. Let me tell you about the hot temperatures. Uh, the, the Russians had to shut down their little robotic lunar cod rovers about two days before lunar noon and about to, until about two days after because the sun was so bright it gave them no contrast, and they couldn't, they couldn't drive with their TV cameras and tell where they were going. So the, the, it's not only just the cold, there's a hot, there's a hot problem out there too with the lunar noon. And uh, it, uh, so uh, those both are big thermal challenges, and uh, that's why I'm trying to convey to folks uh, that uh, they better get serious about it. Uh, and, uh, unfortunately, some of, the, some of the systems, the nuclear systems we had, the, the ALSEP packages, we turned them off in 1977. You know why? For budget, for money. Money wasn't there to keep the tape. They got so many tapes in, they couldn't handle the tapes. In fact, we've tried to recover some data from Atlanta. There's an Atlanta uh, data repository of tapes over there. They get it back over here, and the tape readers couldn't, and they couldn't decipher the data off the tapes because they were, they were old and decrepit or had been damaged. So uh, it's a, nowadays, you've got solid state memory, and you don't have the tapes as much, but uh, that's quite a challenge. Okay, Dave, David. Yes, sir. Um, well, you know, I guess the uh, biggest question I have uh, from from the young generation looking to the older is, uh, it, you know, Logan kind of stole some of my steam from him about a question about sustainability and sustaining it beyond the flags and footprints. It seems like uh, it's more of a maybe a general philosophical thing more than anything else, but it, it seems like uh, uh, our our grand dreams keep getting constrained by uh, uh, political ch shifts and, and and budget realities and everything else. And how do you how do you how do you guys feel about the efforts for commercial space entities to try to do it with or without the government? Let me tell you about commercial. I work with some folks in Ireland who are subcontracted to a group called the Part Time Scientists, and the Part Time Scientists were in the Google X Prize business, and now they're going to try to do a lander. On the moon, they just filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> I was asking, my daughter, daughter says, "When are we going back to Ireland?" We're not going back to Ireland because the, their bosses have fired, filed for bankruptcy. The commercial, uh, they don't have, they don't have the big bucks behind them. Right. It took, it takes big bucks. Well, what we found with uh, the commercial is the commercial survives best when the the commercial is being backed by billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> We had our own little space program here with Halo and Hart, but uh, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be the program manager, but I'm a few shades shy of being a billionaire. <laughs> so ego money funds a lot of that, but you got to have lots of it. Elon Musk will sell you a seat. <laughs> fortunately, well, hey, the chair. Well, fortunately, we do have a, a couple billionaires leading the charge on that, so maybe they'll get us somewhere. So, you have anything else, Dave? Your time's not up. You won't say anything um, else that. Well, you know, it's just kind of, kind of one of those things like uh, uh, Ron uh, hit upon something that, that is, is uh, always uh, a danger in, in, the, in our, our world. Because, you know, there's an old joke about, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you make a million dollars in a year in the rocket industry? Well, you start with 10 million, you know. <laughs> you know it's, it's, it's how do you make money at it, you know, and then it's the... Uh, I, you know, how do you make that business model succeed? We're going to see a lot more of these small teams that don't have a lot of backing falling apart. You um, have to have a this, problem. Right. But this is also a remnant of, of the way the X Prize was set up and how a lot of, there were a lot of jokers that got good publicity up front. 
and, and there's a couple of them that are still in business. Now, part-time scientists I didn't consider to be the jokers. They actually were very smart and well-heeled. They just didn't have the funding. You know, um, there's some other teams I won't name, but uh, the, but the, there was there was a lot of inmates running the asylum and a lot of these different efforts. And one of them actually still has quite a bit of funding, but uh, somehow. Um, but you know, it's it's a. a it's one of these things where I'm like, okay, well, I see a lot of the, I've seen a lot more promise over the next few years. I think at least with initial robotic landers, um, especially with commercial and and with with international interest. I mean, India just launched a lander the other day, so they're going to try to make an attempt pretty soon. You know, Israel actually flew their Google X Prize lander uh, a few months ago. It crashed, but it, it also crashed because it didn't follow our principle called test, test, test. And they, made, they took some big risks because they needed to get a rocket engine in a hurry that wasn't qualified for the environment that they were putting it through. Um, and they crashed really close to the surface. They got almost, almost right. there. Right. They were. Hey, they, they touched the moon. They weren't able to send it back any proof. You know, needless to say, it's happening. China's got landers. You know, there's there's going to be a lot lot more of them in the future. Uh, I'm skeptical about this 2024 date that we've been given. Um, but you know, we'll do the best we can to try to make it happen. <laughs> hey, can I make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, actually, we're, we're going to get back to you guys right now. Uh, what was your uh, comment, Sally, to what we were just talking about? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the, the the thing that needs to be done and wasn't done in Apollo, and is the reason things ended, is NASA did not do enough chest beating and saying, "Here is what you're getting for the money you're putting in." We had 300,000 people working on that program at that time. Many, many of us were engineers, all right? Like me, we essentially got our gut feel for engineering out of this program, went on to do other things. One of the printers that I was lead engineer on, uh, we made, we sold $500 million worth of those things. And a lot of stuff that went into that printer came out of what I learned in Huntsville before I ever went to Charlotte. We worked on a banking system, and we have a, a system that if you go to a Dibo machine today and deposit a check, our software is reading your check. Those things are all over the world, millions and millions of dollars. And that's one little old scrawny guy from Montgomery, Alabama, that didn't know his head holding around. And you look around town, you know, Jim Medlock, Intergraph. Fred Clark, Bill Stender started CAS. They were both, well, uh, Fred was an IBM guy. And there are just literally thousands of stories. And that needs to be brought across that, hey, this is a big research and development program, and you're going to go to the moon or go to Mars or whatever. But as a part of this program, you are going to reap billions and billions of benefits I think that's that's where NASA missed the ball. Okay. Hey, I can talk loud anyway. I don't think. <laughs> we wonder why using that. Here we go. This thing. But anyway, so as I think I kind of alluded to that in the beginning here, where I said that you know the, the digital computer age that we live in today, all these many things from the internet and all the computers even to our phones today. Uh, not just the computer, though. Every automobile that goes down that road. Well, they all have that in the welding technology that came off the S1C. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the spinoffs are that we got out of the Apollo program are, 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 are immeasurable almost in our society. That, however, that was also because the Apollo program had a research aspect that were developing technology. Now the emphasis is to reuse technology as much as possible. Yeah, we don't get as much out of that, but maybe we'll get something because you still got to develop things. We're going to learn a lot, no matter what. Well, having young people get their hands dirty and learn it is probably the biggest, best spinoff we get. And that's what really worked for our Halo program. That's how guys like uh, David might know where he's at because we've got our hands dirty and he knows a lot. From well, I, I would say I add that uh, not everybody, you know, does not live in that uh, non-test mentality because uh, where I work, we do a lot of testing. And uh, I happened to see one of our interns show up here. So I, the, that, that intern is one of the people who we throw into the fire right off the bat to get their hands dirty to see what kind of new ideas that they're going to come up with because they're usually the smarter ones in the room. 
Um, those young ones, they, 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 uh, they, the ones much younger than us, uh, Logan and I here. Um, but no, what, uh, Luke brought up something that made me think of something else here. You know, the Apollo generation was was known. You know, the 400,000 people workforce, 300,000 people workforce. They worked a lot of hours, a lot of 60, 70, 80 hour weeks constantly trying to make this happen. A lot of unpaid overtime. Now, in space programs, uh, Elon Musk has been working his people like that for the last 15 or so years. And there's been a lot of people who have uh, gotten burned out and quit from there who have gone on and started other space ventures and other technology ventures. And I have to, I like to posit that uh, right now the current generation is turning out a whole bunch of really capable engineers with hardware experience because of Elon Musk burning them out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a good thing. So, so now we want to move on here to, uh, to uh, <laughs> our next thing is, and, and Luke actually started this out for me without me prompting it, but what is the key points and answers to, to the young guys their questions, basically, that you have for the next generation. Uh, Ron, you got anything else to add? The test, test, test. And not, we totally agree with that. What, yeah. What's your key points for these guys to answer the questions they ask and just whatever is popping in your mind at the moment? No, I, I think I've covered it. Uh, uh, how are you going to do it without nuclear energy is the, is the main thing, going back to the moon. I honestly feel that's the only answer. But uh, there are resistors to that, there's resistance to that. There were for uh, previous missions, and uh, in fact, uh, people don't realize Apollo. What happened to Apollo 13 radioisotope thermoelectric generator? It's in the, it's in the Marianas Trench. We hope it went down all the way. <laughs> it doesn't float up sometime in the future. Yeah. Long, long term lunar habitation cannot happen without nuclear power. That's exactly exactly. Oh, so so so, so that reactor is buried in Marianas Marianas Trench. Okay. Uh, my friend Ed Cocker buried a nuclear reactor in Alaska. <laughs> the Fort Greene base reactor. So, Skeet, same question to you. What's I don't really have an answer for that one. Uh, the problem is, I think you just got to get in there and do the work and learn, dream a little bit, and have to make mistakes and learn by your mistakes. That's the main thing. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to come up a lot. Weird concepts, and every weird concept is a concept you want. And the best way to learn the answer to those mistakes is by testing. You've got to dream a little bit what you want. It's because if your first first thing is to fly your mission, that's where you're going to learn your mistake, right? Yeah, that's right. But yeah. first successful mission is a mistake because you don't know how close you come to the disaster. Amen. But the next one may be just a wild problem. Greg, like enlarge on that just for a moment. <laughs> All right, Ed. Yeah, you can well, well, yeah, be brief because we're really smoking panels. I was a NASA space architect for a while, and I've been working down at the Black Point uh, lava flow uh, of a flight step, making structures that the astronauts could test on. I was back here, and I had a, a brain cramp. I thought, oh, gee, a wonderful idea. Anyway, let's make two trenches side by side, line them with foam, flip one over onto the other, and I've got an instrument structure. So I called my landlord, had him come out with backhoe and made two trenches. I figured, yeah, I better do this before I talk to other people. And I put in the phone. That night it rained. I looked out the window the next day, and they're gone. There's two empty holes. Well, it rained overnight. And these foam structures were boats. And up they came, and down the hill, and down the creek. Luckily, they got stopped at my neighbor's property. <laughs> Think it through. If it can go wrong, it will. <laughs> yeah, we call that Murphy. And Murphy rules, right? Yeah, Murphy was an optimist. Yes, Murphy was an Okay. <laughs> Luke, do you want to add anything to what you said earlier? No. Okay, then we'll, so we move on to the, to, to, to the younger generation here to ask, what is your key approaches toward implementation from what you've gathered so far? Start with you, Luke. Yeah, to... So test, 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 um, being an engineer mentality into your background, I fully agree with that. Um, but the reason we're getting pushed to do less testing is we don't have the space race. We don't have the 4.5% of the budget that Apollo did. We're very constrained. And so while a lot of us want to do more testing, we want to do green run for SLS and everything, we're working within much less budget than we had and, and a very hard schedule to deal with. 
that's one of the very few hard constraints we've given is this 2024 landing. And you know, uh, if if 100 tests, if enough testing doesn't get you there till 2030, you don't get there at all. So there's 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 not a right answer. Um, you're never going to be able to do enough testing and get there fast enough. So we have to figure out well how much is enough. Uh, what are the best tests? What is the best way to use modern simulation and everything to, to buy down risk? Um, it's, it's a tough world that we're in. So um, uh, we'll, we'll test where we can. And uh, another way that we can, we can deal with it with, the, with Artemis is to, instead of having one lunar mission, one company, one uh, capability, we'll have multiple and carry them as far along as we can so that as they're going along and one has a problem, we have a backup. Um, and we hope that that gets realized as far as budgetary and political uh, realities, but um, it's, we're, we're under some difficult constraints. Wow, so that, that, that is tough, and I know what you're talking about because I'm in it too, and it's an SLS program. But I would like to point out that back when we were developing our hybrid rockets in the old Halo days, uh, I made some observations about rockets, and so I, I figured if Norm Augustine can have his laws about program development, I could come up with something myself. And I came up with three that I call Allison's Laws of Rockets. You gotta keep this, you know, he knows exactly where I'm going with this, David does. One, rockets go boom. Law two, rockets have always gone boom. And law three, rockets always will go boom. Our job is to make them go boom less often. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how we do that with less less uh, with less tests is going to be an extreme challenge. So David, how are you? Well, okay. So I'm going to inject a little observation here as uh, somebody who's been involved with these programs now for uh, you know going on 15 years at least as a as a engineer dealing with them in in the corporate environment, other than stuff in the startup environment and before that. Um, we're always at this fine balancing point between um, relying on the output from software tools that we know are well tested, the tools themselves, and the concepts that we are using these software tools to, are well based on physics and based upon things. And we also, uh, a lot of our analysts benefit from all of the years of testing that were done uh, by your generation, by the Apollo generation. So when it comes to more basic parts of flying to the moon, there's a lot of software tools that have been built that are based upon the data uh, from those previous missions and from a lot of the lessons learned. So if you play with the tools right and you, you, you have the right kind of assumptions and the right iterative process, you can get where you're going pretty quick in your design cycle so you don't need to do as many tests once you start testing. And, and that's one of the things I've been learning at Dynetics where we have a really fast moving team of experts from a bunch of different areas is that you can find that balancing point between, um, between going, well, I don't need to test this because I know this is a fundamental, but uh, this particular part of my requirements is departing way outside of what we understand. So, you know, our software tool is only going to get us so far, so we need to test that. And, and we've, we've, been managed, we've managed to have a lot of success over the years uh, trying to strike that balance. So I could write a whole bunch of papers and dissertations on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next phase of this is going to be a question and answer among the panel. Then we're going to open up the question and answer with the audience to the panel. So uh, how I'll do this is, is, is I'm going to go open format here. Any of you panelists who want to ask a question to another panelist, raise your hand, I'll call it. Or I'll just start calling. All right, Ron, you don't have a question? Skeet, do you have any questions for anybody else here on the panel? Luke, you got any questions for anybody else here? Okay, Logan has a question. All right. Uh, so the lunar orbit rendezvous was a kind of an unusual not the front runner design for a long time, and it ended up running out and saving the Apollo program, I think. Um, I wonder if there are any out of the box ideas like that that, uh, that were around during the Apollo times and either weren't chosen 
because of technology limitations, maybe we're, we're in a different place now um, that, that may be more feasible uh, today. Um, you know, out of the box ideas are, are could save us again. If you want out of the box, you need to go talk to Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> <laughs> he, he certainly gave you us. You have his number? I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. He gave us a lecture the other night that was uh, out of the box. <laughs> and uh, he uh, was very much against the lunar orbit rendezvous, against the lunar gateway. Uh, he was very much against the SLS system. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I talk, he went out of the box, talked to Buzz. He's going to have an institute he's going to make up now of everybody together, get together and uh, come up with a magic solution. One of you, uh, Skeet, I believe you mentioned that you thought we needed to go straight to Maine and not use the Leonard Gateway, that needed a gateway in lower orbit, which was the kind of the Von Braun's original approach, but uh, I think this may be why Gerstenmeyer got demoted, is that he's a, a gateway guy. Well, you know, the big, big, the big thing in your call, Talking oh, to the mic. The mic. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> the big thing in the Apollo program was how do we get to the moon safely and get the man back safely? And so then uh, there were an awful lot of studies in different trajectory ways. The Marshall concept at that time was to stay in Earth orbit and to go to the moon. And this John Hobo came up widely. He came up with the idea for Russian in 1919. He came up with the idea of this moon orbiting around the moon. And he told me, he came to Huntsville, he specifically came 1919? He's 19, in 1919. Was that Tsiolkovsky or? I can't think who the Russian name was, but the Russian. Tsiolkovsky? No, when Tsiolkovsky said it was not long. Anyway, he came with his eye, he came to hunt, he made a pitch. First, nobody would pay attention to him. And he got mad and he said, I feel like I'm a man crying in the wilderness and nobody listened to me. So he got mad, he wrote a letter to Siemens in charge of that program. And Seaman didn't like his idea, but he said, you know, you've got a good idea. Then. Why don't you go talk to Von Brown? So he came down and talked to Von Brown, made a presentation to Von Brown. And Von Brown said, you know, we're going to have to, we got a tight schedule. And if we go this other thing and stay in Earth orbit, we may not make our schedule. So I think you've got the best idea to get there safely and quicker to meet our requirements. So I'm going to push this program myself. And GSC didn't like that too well, but that's what Bob Brown said. That's the way we ought to go. And he convinced Mueller. And Mueller said, that's the way we want to go. But then Bob Brown didn't like the idea of having a full loaded Saturn on the first flight, on the third flight with people on it. But he went ahead and said, we'll try it. And it's amazing, the third flight we had on the shuttle was pretty, pretty almost, I mean, the, the, the Saturn was very amazing fate. Everything worked perfectly almost. We had a little pogo, but we had a real pogo on 502. 502, we almost we could have almost lost the vehicle on 502. And then these guys come on it and go to Apollo 8. And to me, they're my hero, not being on the phone. Oh, yeah. Because but they actually went there first. They didn't land. But they, they didn't have the limb to back them up either, but that's what all 13 had. And they proved they could come home in a spaceship that never ended in 36 seconds. And they, they, they did it, they, they also did it in a spacecraft that had only been tested in one flight before in low Earth orbit. And, and that's, that's, that takes some gumption because today's planning schedule is a lot more uh, conservative when it comes to that stuff. Just look at uh, the introduction of commercial crew right now. Yeah, well that, that was interesting. That's why I say the guys like Skeet and Ron and Lick, we could literally listen these guys all night. They got so many stories to tell us and so much to learn. So I want to get all you guys back in the future for, for some future talks, all, every one of you, to have, to have five. One, one thing I should say, I still think the space program today is exactly like aviation was in 1920 and 1930. What happened between 1920 and 1930? We didn't have very much aviation at all, although we proved the airplane was useful in war. And, and then later on, John Douglas built the DC-3 airplane. And, and Howard Hughes bought a number of those airplanes and formed an airline. And then Warren Tripp formed an airline in New York at the same time. So now we have an aviation infrastructure being created. That's so it's like the billionaire using the, the system and, and getting and started. And like, every one of those will be in that system. Yeah. And so I think that's where we are right. We're, we're in an in interim stage right now. We'll have to wait and see how this commercial operation to work. Yeah, and, I, and I look forward just a few years. It, it's looking it's looking up, right? So David was talking about uh, the, the Indians and the Israelis and everything. 
But there's also, uh, domestically, there's this commercial lunar payload services program where we are paying, and, and the first three got awarded, 70, 80 million dollars to these small companies um, to land cargo on the moon. Yeah. Um, and we are supposed to kind of get NASA out of the business and just buy services, just buy rides. Um, you know, like the mail service is what made airlines so successful. We're going to be buying cargo rides to the moon. They're supposed to be starting in 2021 with Astrobotic and other companies. Um, at least one cargo delivery to the surface of the moon every single year is the theory. Um, that's, and, if, and if we can, if NASA can get out of the way and make them successful and profitable, you know, I would like to joke that Astrobotic, there's, I'm not used to a business focused space industry with NASA, but Astrobotic, you can send your wedding ring to the moon for a million dollars. It's, it's a really interesting, different way of doing things. They're so, they're, they've, they've actually managed to finance a lot of their mission up until this point by selling payload space, uh, ride share space, basically. In fact, one of one of their payloads is a Japanese energy drink, and on their first lander, and they have a it's a can of this Japanese energy drink, and it's sitting at the end of a platform on the lander. And there's an HD camera looking at it from the side and looking at it down, so you can see it during landing and see it when it's on with the moon in the background when it's on the moon. And so I, I don't know how much they paid for that, but uh, they're they're a pretty lightweight, low energy using experiment. Well, what what? what uh, Logan was talking to here is actually a philosophy that I was championing back in, two, I believe it was 2006 at the ISDC where I got to debate uh, 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 Bob Zubrin and uh, Rick Tomlinson and it was listed to the Space Review as the great space debate and I actually championed the notion that, private, that NASA should be the, the forward edge of an ever expanded bubble of exploration with private enterprise coming behind the service instead of trying to do the whole logistics supply chain because that just totally eats your budget up. So that, that, that use the government to do the exploration and let the private industry fill in behind it in an ever expanded sphere of service, support service capabilities. Because you take HAL 5, what's this organization about? It's about the human colonization of space. And we're not going to get there based on a budget like you've given that an agency like NASA or any governmental agency. We have to, we're going to have to have private industry come in and get involved to, to make it happen. The governments can't carry that kind of burden of developing an entire economy. And that's what we're talking about, an entire economy. But governments can be the catalyst, the spur, to, to get it started. Just like uh, governments were the spur for aviation with a mail service, the spur for a railroad service by, with land grants and different things like that. The government can do a lot to spur it along. Uh, the, uh, I was at uh, the, the uh, Space Frontier Foundation when David Anderman uh, posed a question to us advocates and he says, what purpose, just tell me one good reason to have the ISS. But then, back then the Space Frontier Foundation wanted to kill it. And I said, I can think of one. And, and he looked at me with indignation, what is that? I said, by virtue of being there, the space station is going to require resupply and it will be beyond what NASA will be willing and able to pay for the space shuttle. They're going to need commercial companies to provide resupply to ISS. Well, he was still indignant. Well, NASA won't allow anybody to get near their ISS. But it was funny, a few years later, he formed one of the initial companies to try to do just that. And today, that's what Elon Musk and several others are quite involved in. So uh, that's happening today. Yeah, I mean, that is what's happening. That, that following mobile, whatever you want to call it. So, um, commercial cargo is resupplying space station. NASA's out of the out of the, the, the line for that. And then commercial crews coming up this year, next year, if you're one of this, um, to, to not buy Russian Russian seats. Um, but with the moon's a lot harder, right? Leo is the easy rocket science. Um, going to the moon and, and how we leverage commercial industry is uh, what we're figuring out right now. So clips, commercial lunar resupply, these are small landers, they're tens of kilograms of, of cargo. Um, when you start going bigger than that, how much government involvement do you need to have? Um, you know, there was the, the, just this past week, we, they started announcing how that partnership is gonna work with Artemis. And it's very commercial heavy, but this, this schedule that we're, we're under is, is insane. So uh, how do we make commercial successful? And there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, uh, new contract types that NASA's playing with too, that there's this, there's the Space Act Agreement, uh, non, no funds exchanged. We've done a lot of research with NASA doing that. 
where we build something and NASA tests it for us. Um, there's several of those things that have been helping these commercial lander providers along already where NASA is able to share some of their critical resources in areas where the commercial companies don't have uh, the people to do that kind of stuff to help with the design on these different things. Where the commercial company is actually the customer for the NASA people to do that work. There's, there's, there's several, uh, oh the tipping point stuff is another one that's a major thing where not only does the company have to submit something that's innovative, but the company actually has to put their own skin in the game. And that's kind of a, a little bit... That of, makes a big difference. Let me tell you all about, let me tell you all about commercialism. Uh, you all remember Tang, the orange juice? <laughs> uh, well, they, I even have a little model of a rover that was on a Tang model. The Tang, uh, the tang is a solid, you mix it up. Well, John Young, he was less enamored of it. They had it rigged up in his <laughs> helmet. To have a feeder tube to come, and the feeder tube got caught in his ear, and uh, boy, he was not happy for mo most of an EBA there until he could get back and get that helmet off. So uh, that was my. You talk about the Japanese and their orange drink. That was our orange drink back there in the Apollo day. Tang for John Young. <laughs> they should have done some testing, right? Test, test, test. <laughs> He can't, we have a question for the, for the He couldn't get his hands in there. I mean, he's in his helmet and it's stuck in his ear. What are you going to do? Okay, we're about to move on to the, to the uh, audience Q&A. By the way, if people want to know why I was uh, doing that with Rick Thomason and, and Bob Zuber, and I was chairman of the policy committee of the National Space Society for 10 years. For those that don't know me, and spent a little stint as chairman of the, uh, the uh, executive committee, the chairman of the executive committee was the CEO of the NSS. And so I've been executive vice president of the NSS. Had a lot of positions like that over, over the years. Crazy stuff. Anyway, Greg's edition. You have the first question. Greg A to Greg Z, you had your hand up first, so go for it, Greg. Lots of questions for this panel I'd love to ask. Uh, I think I'm just going to uh, drop a, bit of a, a question bomb uh, and get the panel's opinion about a little alternate history. I've become convinced lately that. Uh, that Apollo would have gone on, and we would have, would have gone on much longer if the Soviet N1 rocket had actually worked. If the Soviets had actually succeeded, uh, would we? What, what do you think would have happened or not? Do you think that was a? Yeah, you're exactly right. We we actually knew about the last major explosion that uh, killed a good amount of people uh, right before Apollo 11. The space race was over. We, we knew that it was a, it was a done deal. But you're right, it did not continue on because they, they had to quit. There's actually a uh, science fiction TV series that's debuting, I believe, on Amazon. Uh, that's the premise of that is the Russians beat us to the moon. And, 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 it's, and it's what do we do now? And all the grand plans that got canceled after Apollo. The, the gentleman here in the blue shirt who had asked a question very early. Yeah, yeah, uh, over here. Uh, yeah. Swift, Stephanie Swift. Uh, this is for Ron, the thermal guy. Yep. So let me get you the microphone. <coughs> okay, uh, I've done a little work on uh, space and lunar environment. And uh, as you say, uh, with 15 days of uh, daylight and 15 days of dark, the moon is indeed a harsh mistress. I think that's been said before. Uh, but there's one spot where that's not true. And that's at the poles. At the poles you have a completely different scene. You, because of the low inclination of the orbital angle, you don't have seasons so much like they do on Earth. So uh, the sun is just kind of spinning around. That means the shadows are dark, you got water, yay team. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've got a solar collector, it's up there uh, uh, all the time, as long as you rotate it to chase the sun. And heat radiators go any direction at that point. Uh, so I was kind of wondering, uh, what does that do to the thermal environment uh, that you're talking about, uh, uh, as far as temperatures and all of that? Has that been investigated? Yes, it has. And it, it's cold. It's cold there, and it's really cold in the shadows. Uh, it's, uh, cause you, you, so it's very difficult to get to the poles. Uh, and uh, the poles are limiting. Uh, maybe there's a promise of water there and all, but that's not, ex 
we're building a system that explores the whole moon. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not enamored of going just to the poles. The reason why that there is ice water at there's ice at the poles is because of those cold traps. Cold trap. And, and uh, so, so you know, there's those sh it shadows get to what ten Kelvin, twenty Kelvin, or something like that. And how are you going to operate a machine to mine the ice? And down in those shadow temperatures that never see daylight. Uh, but the first mission, maybe missions, is explicitly going to the South Pole. Uh, there is a mission now going there. Yeah, the, the first part of the The Indians are landing there. Well, they're actually going to 70 degrees. Yeah. They're not going all the way to the pole. They're going to 70, 70 latitude. And I know something about living next to the pole. Yeah, it's much higher latitude than yeah. the Apollo missions, that's for sure. Um, oh, here we go. Bill got a question. Bill. Well, I actually uh, have a comment and a question. Uh, I just did a school event to kinder kindergarten to sixth grade at uh, over here at uh, Mill Creek Elementary. They have a science camp about the SLS rocket, and I wanted to let you know that in that generation, aerospace engineers are rock stars. <laughs> They're very, very enthusiastic about space. One hundred percent of them want to go to the moon. 80% of them said they would go to Mars. In fact, the same 80% said they would go even if it was a one-way ticket. <laughs> and one of them actually guessed Michael Collins. <laughs> and knew the name of the uh, command module. So I was very impressed by uh, how smart these kids are and how excited they are about aerospace. Now, as far as commercial, I'm going to ask you a question, and I know you all know the answer to this. How do you make a little bit of money in private aerospace industry? Start with a lot. There. You know the answer. <laughs> oh, you already did that. You already answered it. Start with a really large one. Oh, yeah. I'm behind. That's good. It's good to hear that kids are thinking about that. Um, but I think that may be a, a Huntsville-centric thing. I talked to some kids out not in a, Hunts, in a NASA city, and they think NASA was is, is done because the shuttle program ended. Um, and they, well, That's what I thought when the Apollo program made when I was a right. kid. It's unfortunately, I've heard well, many Shell is just going around, around Earth, what's that? Right, I've heard many, many people think that NASA is, is gone because the shuttle's gone and so we don't, what are we doing these days? Mm -hmm. so. right, I can attest to that too, uh, a lot of out-of-town out of conversations. Well, yeah, Next question right here, I feel like Phil Donahue here running around. <laughs> okay, the sure, guys working on the future missions. What is being done to mitigate the effects of the dust. Because I had an Apollo astronaut tell me that that was the biggest problem they had. Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's a big concern. Um, so one way is you can have the externally mounted suits where you crawl into them from the outside or from the inside and then close a hatch and you never have to get dust inside where the, where the humans yeah, are. Dust all to, to illustrate how extreme it is, Harrison Schmidt told us that if they had had to do one more EVA on Apollo 17, they would not have been able to get back in the spacecraft and come home because their suits would have been too bound up. Yep. Yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, we're early on in this big mission, but it is very much a concern, just like the Spartan Light is a big concern. This is a big concern for a number of reasons, definitely health and medical being the first one, but also how it uh, interacts with mechanisms. Okay. For, for those that don't know, that dust is like little bitty tiny yeah. microscopic shards of glass. Yeah. It's sharp, it's jagged, it's bad. Yeah. Really bad. Now we have a question right here. And then the other thing is, is as he's walking to answer uh, it. To, to I just question. want to stand up to say something so I can embarrass Skate. I'm Skate's wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> so you, you say, you'll see what he has to put up with at home. <laughs> but uh, my question was for the young engineers, you know, if I start to bake a cake, I'm always telling my grandkids that, you know, if I start to bake a cake and I bake a cake and then I decide, well, I'm going to do an icing, I'm going to do it on another pan, so I do that. You see where I'm going here? Mm -hmm. Y'all did the, we did the lunar landing, but you didn't have anywhere to go with it. And then you did the shuttle and you didn't have anywhere to go with that. I mean, it was just, you just ended. 
So I hope that in the future you'll you'll get a big picture, and when you do something, you'll it'll be going it'll be going to something. And I also talked about the commercial thing. If you'd come, uh, if Columbus had come over here, he would have vanished like all the others. But he came over here for a commercial reason to uh, find things and take them back to the old world. So if you don't get a commercial reason for going, uh, or some reason for going other than just just going to the moon, just proving that. Uh, I think we've got engineers that can do that, and I have all the confidence in the world in our new people, but we need a reason to go and to do something. Well, I think, I think the reason's there, and I think that uh, it's going to happen regardless. Uh, uh, re the return to the moon is an international thing now, and we, we either we either need to go or get surpassed. And and you know that's that's the key because there are resources to exploit on the moon, not just ice. There's 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 you know there's uh, evidence that uh, craters from heavy asteroids uh, have are rich in platinum group metals. Um, that, that's a pretty useful thing. There's all these different things where there's commercial interest. One of the linchpins has been the cost of access and the lack of infrastructure. And now you've got a lot of different parallel efforts right now that are trying to bring that down. And you've also got, well, you've also got a lot of flexing and flag waving going on too. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the, the, the chances of, of governments being interested in this when China and, and, and other countries are saying, hey, we're going to go claim that water ice on the south pole of the moon. You know, that's pretty, actually pretty provocative of them to land their, uh, their most recent lander and rover just beyond the line of sight on the far side of the moon near the south pole because that, you know, that just, they demonstrated multiple capabilities of doing that. You know, it's kind of a... That was the Chinese. Yeah, that was the Chinese lander. So now the Indians are about to land something they launched a couple days ago. So... I don't think there's any reason to, to, to beg for justification now. Um, it's happening. It's just a matter of we just need to be a part of it. And Bezos, Jeff Bezos of Amazon is saying that's what he wants to do with his Blue Origin company is commercialize. And so uh, the, it's beginning. We're to, it, it's, uh, uh, Skeet or Ron, one of you gentlemen said a minute ago, where I believe it was Skeet said it, that, that we're really like in the 1920s. Uh, with space today, and I agree with that. We have a question way back here in the blue shirt. Got to come up. I don't think this microphone will reach all the way to you there. Yeah, and just to comment on that, you know, we need a reason to go, but also a reason to stay. And one of the few reasons to stay is because it makes financial sense. Um, so if we can, if we can get, and every single launch, every single technology we develop to to get there cheaper, it means it makes more and more financial sense. So it's all going in the right direction. I don't want to sound like a, a, a naysayer, and those of you who know me know that I'm a big space fan, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm the last guy to discourage talk about going back to the moon, something I've been pulling for for a long time. But I got to tell you that when you talk about the DC-3, the reason we got the DC-3 was because people like Langley, Research Center developed the cowling that reduced drag, the monocoque fuselage, the retractable landing gear, the variable pitch propeller, all of these things made the airplane efficient enough so where the economic barriers were met. And that was only after a lot of government subsidy mm -hmm. to get the airline business on its feet. The barrier to entry for space and particularly lunar lunar exploration is so much higher that we, and we are so far behind where we need to be to reduce the barrier to entry. That's why we cannot afford to have what I call the pork barrel uh, engineering component, where we can't make engineering decisions based on the physics, we've got to make them based on politics. And unfortunately, there's too much of that. We've got to keep our eyes on the prize, figure out how to lower the barrier of entry to, to Earth orbit first, and then, when we can, expand our presence on the moon, and eventually, we'll find out whether we can do a sustained 
uh, thing there. And I think people, when you say, how do we prevent people from losing interest, we, people will be excited as long as there's exploration. And I've always believed that, and I continue to believe that. So. Well, I'll, I'll respond to that in part. I started saying the Apollo program, you got to remember that when the Apollo program came along, only about 40% of the Americans were in favor of it. That's right. It was not a, it was not a big thing. It was not a unanimous, it was, it was never a unanimous thing. And Roger Lanius has done a lot of good work about the public opinion polls. It's a mythology. And by the way, the budget started coming down in 1967. And it was way, way down by the time we landed. And by 1970, NASA was already in survival mode, which was one of the reasons why they gave in to the OMB demand that the shuttle be cost competitive, which was a losing proposition for NASA. But they didn't have a choice because they were in survival mode. So how do we prevent that situation from happening again? We've got to, we've got to, be, we've got to be able to stand up and, and say, look, what you're asking us to do is not going to get us there. It's not going to get you stakeholders what you want. Let us do what makes sense from the, from the physics. Well, from programmatic and political, you know, no bucks, no buck Rogers, and you have to go back to get the bucks. Yeah. And and then national priorities changed. We, we had an unprecedented amount. I mean, we, we had a Manhattan Project level of effort to get to the moon in the 1960s. We could have spent that money being at war with the Soviet Union. Um, you know, and that's kind of, to me, that's where, where it all boils down to. What I think constrained us on the Apollo program, looking back on it, is that we met our 1969, we met our goal, right. and we won. We won the space race, and there was no frontiers left, and we won the, we well, won the space not, that's race. That's the only reason we did it. Well, here's the thing. The cost of winning the space race, uh, the cost of winning the space race was we had to get there to meet the schedule, we made design decisions that made our entire infrastructure unsustainable. Unsustainable, so when it was over, it was over. Now, that goes back to something else that I was about to make the point of. We're relying in part on political funding to get this thing gamed. As you mentioned, all these uh, uh, airlines and aviation development activities had a lot of government subsidy behind it. So that gets back to the pork barrel thing. It, it's and this is something I've talked and written articles about myself in the past. Uh, you don't go to a politician and, and hand him something and say, we need to do this because it's a good idea. I mean, we do it all the time, but they don't ever listen. They don't hear anything you say. When you go to them with the best idea in the world, it's in one ear and out the other, you, you're just doing this. They don't hear a word you say. When you say jobs in their district, or something that gets them reelected, bang, then, then they're, they're, you woke them up. That's the unfortunate reality we have. And, and, and that's why NASA spreads its projects peanut butter wise all over the United States. That's no way to run a space program or anything, technically, because you have so much interfaces, that's your expense. And everything is awfully inefficient when you do that. Yeah, like ISS. You know, it was the most complex vehicle we ever put up, but it's because we had a zillion ICDs. The, the cost of the, the vehicle wasn't technology. It's tin cans with plumbing and wiring running through it. It, it, it strung together. The cost was the integration, the inter, uh, interface connect, uh, control documents. Those ICDs are the cost of the, uh, of the ISS, it's not anything else. We can't make that design change because it's going to cost too much to change the supporting documentation that supports so, that design change. So, so the, the, the key here is how do we, as a space community, uh, rev up the notion of, of space being so important that we get a higher national priority for it? And, and, that's what we've got to work on. But somehow we've got to talk to the politicians at the same time. Because we're not going to get there the way we've been doing it. And, and, and as you pointed out, you've got to have the, the juice in the system to get... Space is like this. It's like a, a chemical system. In a chemical system, sometimes you need an energy of activation to get things to a higher energy state. It's an investment. For space, that's a huge investment. And we really haven't got there yet. Uh, uh, but on the higher energy state, if we had a true space economy, utilizing resources of space, we would be in a whole different economic realm for humanity. It would be unbelievable. But you can't use that justification to get the people to put the money into it. So we've got to work on that. That is a challenge. And that challenge falls on us. 
It falls on us to figure out how to sell that. Do you have an answer to that? You have to lower the other side of the equation. You have to lower the cost of, in, of getting into lower door. We're working that, and people like Musk right. and, and, and Bezos are working that. They're making more progress on that than anybody probably right now. And that's what uh, so, was talking So about. as somebody who's been learning the hard way about being a project manager over the last few years, and I think Logan might be able to attest to this as well, you start to learn about the development curve and the money and how you spend your money in that development curve. Um, when you say that NASA peak funding was 1967, well, peak funding in 1967, 66, 66 yeah. correlates with gearing up for the very first flights of the Saturn V, right. and gearing, and, and not only that, but finishing all the development of the lunar module, finishing all the development of the command and service module. You were at peak NRE, peak non-recurring engineering, and if we had just said, hey, let's just buy these until we can't buy them anymore. We, we would have gotten a much higher return on our investment. We, we uh, invested in a very reliable system in the Saturn rockets and in the Apollo Command and Service Module, and we walked away from it after so many flights. And, and uh, you know, there's that whole sunk cost fallacy. But where I was going to go is with, with this is that this is what Musk is doing. This is what, what, what uh, Bezos is doing, is they're building upon their past success. Musk has got his people, or SpaceX is working on this Starship thing now, which is their next generation reusable launch vehicles. Very bold, very, very, you know, earth shattering in what they want to do with it. Um, I don't believe any of their schedule projections. But <laughs> at, at the same time, he said, well, what am I going to do with this workforce that I've been having developed the Falcon 9 now that we're done developing the Falcon 9? Well, let's put them to work and keep them being creative on let's design the next generation. And, you well, know, we could have done that in 1967. pull that off, wow. If they can pull that off, and if, the, and if the Starship performs as advertised, it will be a huge game changer, undoubtedly. And what, that's what we know about, because Musk is, you know, he's kind of like, he's loud, and he's a barking dog, but we got, we got uh, also Bezos, who's quiet, he's the cat guy, and uh, we, we know he's got a new Shepard rocket, uh, that, that was, did a little suborbital thing for fun stuff. And then we know he's talking to Newt Glenn. That's his big orbital workforce. Well, is there a new Armstrong out there? I mean, what, what's the next one? I mean, yeah. who knows what he's coming up with? Because he's, you know, he may reveal some things, but he's he's the cat guy. He just reveals what he really needs to when he needs to, uh, like he did his lunar lander. So it's fortunate for us that we have the day's equivalent of uh, Howard Hughes. Uh, in, in this industry, and, and we got a couple of them, and, and Musk and, and, and Bezos. So the Bezos been real huge. Musk is and not no, nowhere near as rich. But then again, if we can keep NASA providing the incentive by having that that, that leading edge of an exploration bubble, and asking the private companies to come in and fill in behind us, and giving them other ways to make money in the progress, I think we've got to start on that. But still, it does befall us as citizens, as enthusiasts and advocates, to call for this and to point out why these things matter, what's important. Uh, also, what was going on right now, 25 years ago, was Earth, uh, the planet Jupiter was being impacted by Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. It's very interesting that the first impact occurred on the silver anniversary of the launch date of Apollo 11. The largest impact occurred on the landing day of Apollo 11. And so uh, those went up through the 22nd of July. 21 impacts on Jupiter, creating fireballs as big as Earth. Tomorrow, in celebration of our 50th anniversary of the splashdown day, we have three asteroids coming simply close to Earth. So uh, People need to wake up. You know, there, there are reasons to have a space program. If the you know, you know, just ask the dinosaurs. You know. <laughs> so, do we have any other questions from the audience? Any other questions from the audience? We got one back here. Okay. And then we're about to run out of time here, but uh... um, this was sort of brought up already, uh, but I wanted to address it more directly. Um, the Apollo was just the U.S. Uh, now we're talking about, and well, with the IS, uh, with the International Space Station, we brought on international partner, partners that had us committed that, okay, we're, we've got to stick this through. How does uh, things like 
uh, the, the gateway um, that we're kind of locked in with these other partners. How does that change the game? Does it at all? Um, the, the, the recent missions have been very domestic focused, uh, for better or worse. The gateway, which you know, I have opinions on. Um, it, it, it was intended to originally have uh, international partnerships, but with the 2024 focus, that was shoved aside for schedule reasons. That's probably why Gerson Meyer has been moved aside also. But it did, it was very much international focus. But we do have the Europeans building the service module for, for the Orion. So we do have some international partnership. But fortunately, the interna international community is getting involved on their own. Like we just mentioned India has got a mission on the way now. China just landed prior to that. So we had one of the gentlemen back here. That was it? Okay. I wanted to say one thing. Y'all are forgetting what killed off, helped kill off. We had this thing called Vietnam War going on. And that, that had an equal effect on budgets and lack of budgets. I asked, I asked the students, tell me where the three Saturn Fives are that didn't go to the moon, all 18, 19, and 20. Y'all think about it. Talk to you later. Okay, well, I want to make a statement first. Uh, that if you want, last question. Okay. If you want um, out of the box thinking, just look to Freeman Dyson back in 1960s when he had his project, uh, Project Orion. <laughs> Yeah, literally a spaceship propelled by nuclear bombs. But the other question is, is kind of segueing in that one. Do you see any, you've talked about rockets and the fact they will eventually blow up. And, uh, what do you feel about looking at alternatives to rockets, you know, things like, um, I don't know, uh, the space elevator, for example, or mass drivers? I think a space elevator is a goofy idea. I don't think it will work for one second. I'll tell you why. It's a long structure. It's going to be subject to hit, being hit by orbital debris. You're going through the ionosphere, which is electrically charged. The thing that's going to be like a, a giant electric conductor, I think it's the most idiotic concept I've ever heard for space development. And a lot of people are really behind that. Excuse me. Uh, you can attack me all you want. I think that is just nuts. Lunar elevator. But, but <laughs> now if you want to do rotating tethers and some of these other things like Bob Ford talked about, that makes some sense. Uh, mass drivers are, are a great idea uh, within certain parameters. So, but to, that, that elevator stuff. Yeah, here's, here's, here's the key right here. Y'all can take issue with me on that. But here's the key right here, Tim, is that Delta V is king. And, and even if you ride a space elevator to or, low orbit uh, altitude, you're not going orbital velocity, and and you're just going to fall right back to the Earth, and so the rocket equation is a harsh mistress, and and there's that term, there's that exponential term. Well, well, and one, <laughs> I just want to say one thing: if the space elevator does, if the when the space elevator reaches uh, geostationary orbit, it's going to be traveling at orbital velocity. Right, but the the, uh, the the trip. Yeah, I know that, it takes a while. The trip does take a while. Anyways, <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> anyway, so much for, for my, uh, my my little uh, soapbox there. <laughs> all right, anybody in the panel have anything else? Uh, thank you all for coming out. This thank time. you, everyone. We're going to have these guys back for future programs for HAL 5. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Fact, uh, our September speaker is sitting with us right here. Luke Talley is going to be talking about his whole career arc on uh, September 12th at the Huntsville Madison County Public Library. Nuclear propulsion next month on the 8th. At the library. At the library, 7 p.m. Hey, want to hear a funny story? Yeah, yeah go ahead. The other day I was out at Space and Rocket Center and a guy walks up and he said, I've got a question for you. He whips out his cell phone and he starts punching in some internet address or whatever. And he shows me this picture of an astronaut's foot in his boot. And he said, all right, here's uh, supposed to be Neil Armstrong's foot. And here's a picture of him on the moon. The bottom of that boot don't look like that picture. So I explained, well, you know, before they get on the moon, they have to put on the boot because it has the deep cleats and keeps them from slipping. He looks at me like, mm. well, all right, I've got another question for you. So how do you know we went to the moon? I said, it's on the internet. <laughs> He turned around and walked off.